Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. Good to be back. Uh, I'm glad that Chief Kirby went before me, so I'm, I don't get. I wouldn't first up right after lunch because uh, he had the tough slot. Thanks, Chief, for taking that one for the team. All right. What I want to do today is present our proposed budget and the quarterly report. As you know, we've been given a, a report every quarter, and it's time for that as well. So we're going to do both of those. Uh, for the new members of the council, I'd like to uh, remind, uh, remind the other members of the council, but the two new members, we started out last year when I came on board uh, focusing on following the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing that issued a 168-page report in May of 2015, and it laid out what they uh, called the pillars of policing, the six pillars of successful policing. And we, we are building our, uh, our strategic plan based around accomplishing these, these six pillars, these goals. The first being building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, uh, making sure that our policies uh, comply uh, with, with state and federal law, and making sure they're best practices. Uh, technology and social media, uh, you will hear about some of the upgrades in technology we're doing and working with social media with uh, the Office of Communication. Uh, community policing and crime reduction, this is one that's always uh, difficult for, for a lot of street cops to, to wrap their head around because I was an 18-year street cop, and we think crime fighting and community policing are two separate things, okay? But they're not. If you look at the crime paradigm where you have to have a victim, an offender, and that offender has to have an opportunity, two-thirds of that puzzle are on education and prevention. So community policing, building those relationships, teaching people good practices and how to be aware of their surroundings and how to prevent from being a victim is paramount to reducing the actual number of offenses. We tend to focus on the enforcement piece, just going after the bad guy. Don't get me wrong, we, there are some people that just need to be locked up. If they're not dead or in jail, they're going to be messing somebody over, and it's our job to hunt them down and lock them up. So we're, we're not going to in any way abdicate our, our, our position in hunting down bad folk. So, uh, but community policing and crime reduction go hand in hand. Um, training and education, making sure we have the very best in-service training and basic training for our officers and officer wellness and safety. This is something of particular importance to me, being a police officer for 29 years uh, and uh, seeing a lot of officers have very successful careers and then uh, retire due to health reasons and, and, and not have taken care of themselves through the years and, and end up not having a very, very long retirement at all. And so we want folks to enjoy, uh, I'd, I'd like to see them get as many years in retirement as they had when they were working. That's the goal. That's not the reality right now by any means, but that's the goal. So those are the six pillars of the President's Task Force that we're trying to pursue in every opportunity to accomplish those things. You are, we also are operating under the city council's goals. These are the strategic goals that were given to us. Uh, I won't read each one of them to you, but th those are the, the uh, high priority goals. And these are the other, uh, oh, here's, here's the other high priority goals. These are, those were strategic goals that we were given. So each one of these, everything we do, we try to build every one of our budget um, proposals um, and uh, programs are accomplishing these goals. Everything we do, as an organization, should be centered to be accomplished one of these. If we're not accomplishing one of those uh, goals and incorporating them into our practice, then, then we shouldn't be doing it. Our mission statement, again, this is the mission statement. It's been the Mesquite uh, Police Department for, for since before I was here. It's a solid uh, mission statement, and we strive every day to, to, to live it out to fulfill it. Okay, based on the strategic goals in, uh, that the city council gave us and based on uh, trying to accomplish those six th pillars of policing, we developed a five-year plan last year of personnel and technology to accomplish those goals. Uh, year one of the personnel plan was to uh, get two canine officers, which have been introduced to you. They're, they're fully operational. They've been out on the street since, since May. Uh, Two civilian analysts, and we have the two, our two analysts are here today, Lauren and Nellie, would you please stand up? They've been on board about two weeks. To, to, uh, they're going to be our crime analysts, the, the first in the, ever in Mesquite, so thank you very much. So uh, the civilian dispatch manager, Ms. Danielle Decoudreau, you've met her already, she's on board. And the two public safety prof uh, public uh, service professionals, we've, uh, we've hired those. They were internal hires. They were just promoted into that position. And so uh, you know them as well. You've seen them around. That, so. We've completed all of the uh, personnel hiring goals for last year at this point. So everybody's on board and, and, and we're getting after it. 
the uh, technology plan, uh, this was the, the deploy software. That's the staffing model software that we purchased last year. Uh, just to, a reminder for some of you and for the two new members, uh, this deploy software is a uh, from Corona Solutions, what we would do is we upload it into our computer system, our computer assisted dispatch. It takes four years of call data, and, and, it, and it makes a workload analysis, does a workload analysis of that call data. It gives calls various weights. Uh, an automobile accident on the highway takes more time and more people than just a live music call. So it averages the time, uh, the workload, and gives us a recommendation on staffing of how many people should be on each, uh, at work each day at what time and what days off. And so we build our staffing model based on, on that software. So that's been fully implemented. We started it last October or November with the, with the bid for this year. Online reporting software at ATAC, Rage, Crime Analysis Software, those two cannot come online until Spillman comes fully online, but uh, we'll integrate those and, and add those there. The online reporting software is going to be so if someone doesn't want to uh, come in to see the police or call the police and wait for us to get there, they can go online and make a report, you know, um, uh, through the Internet. And ATAC raids will allow us to share our crime data with other agencies in the, in the region, and uh, when we do our analysis, we can look at their suspects and, and, and their crime trends, and we can compare. Since there's no uh, borders, criminals don't know borders, so whoever hits us is hitting Dallas, is hitting Garland, is hitting Ball Springs. So this will give us the ability, and it will give our two analysts, Nellie and Lauren, the ability uh, to share that information and to see other, other agencies' data. Uh, and then mobile monitoring systems, uh, five of those. Uh, two, we're going to be trailers. I'll show you a picture of those in a minute. Uh, camera trailers, we can pull and deploy wherever we want to or need to where there's a power supply. Three are fixed cameras. Pole cameras will be set up on a, on, on a telephone pole or power pole where we can get a, a power to them. And then one mobile uh, LPR, that's a license plate reader system. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that one in a minute as well. So our projects for this budget year between the personnel and the technology is here. You can see that most of the over half of them are complete. Uh, the Spillman, we're scheduled to go online with that August 22nd. Spillman is going to be big for us because not only is it our CAD, it's, it's our computer assisted dispatch. It's also a records management system and it's a field based reporting system. So all three system major technology systems that we use every day will be integrated into one one product currently. Uh, those are usually parceled out between three separate products, three different companies, and you're trying to make three, three different people's uh, product work together, and they never integrate well. Spillman gives us a tremendous opportunity to make that all one, more seamless for the officer on the street. This is really geared to the patrol officer on the street making their job easier, may, making their ability to access information from the field, whether it's tickets or previous calls to location, anything, and gives them more information at, at, their, at, at their disposal in the field. Uh, deploy software, of course, has been done. So all the others are just about done. Um, ATAC raids and online reporting again when Spillman comes online and uh, mobile LPR and those others we talked about. Our budget for last year, the adopted budget, you can see there was 33, uh, just over 33 million. This year we're proposing 33 million 615. It's an increase of about 400, uh, a little over 403 thousand dollars. Uh, that was. Uh, this is our work order credits, uh, reimbursements we get, like for the SRO program. Uh, the MISD uh, reimburses us 50% of the total cost. That's the salaries, benefits, uh, uniforms, gas, vehicles, everything. So we uh, we get a full 50% reimbursement. Our budget office for this year, the Enhanced Crime Scene Program. This was year two, the personnel uh, on the, um, uh, the, the plan. In this proposal last year in the five-year plan, we originally asked for two additional police officers this year, and these uh, enhanced crime scene program was going to be two civilian crime scene technicians who were going to go out and take fingerprints at property, uh, property crime scenes so the officers wouldn't have to stay and do that. The officers could be free to do other things. So the intent is to free up officers' times. Since we've gotten the public safety professionals fully online, uh, the other four that we, uh, six that we currently have, they've all been trained to do fingerprints, to take fingerprints. And so we decided to defer those two police officers, since we're having trouble filling the vacancies we have now, to next budget year and go ahead with these two uh, in crime scene uh, public safety professionals who, who increase our capacity to gather those fingerprints at those scenes. And it, it, it's significantly cheaper. That also includes the price uh, for a vehicle. 
a three-quarter ton pickup truck that they can drive around. They won't be driving police uh, mark squads. They'll be driving a pickup truck. Because the public safety professionals, one of their additional duties besides uh, uh, the crime scene taking fingerprints. Yes, sir. Well, I, and I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So you're saying that instead of sworn, these will be non-sworn personnel? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just, just taking fingerprints at property crime scenes. Got it. We'll still have sworn members doing other crime scene tasks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the enhanced crime scene program, that's what it would be. Uh, well, and I had a, to, to tie into that same question. So uh, these, uh, these analysts, now, are the analysts and the, the PSOs, these are two different jobs. Is that, is that right or? No, no sir. The, the crime scene technicians we proposed last year, that was a separate job description. We hadn't had those before. We were going to create that job description working with HR. And what we found is with the PSP, we promoted those, those public safety professionals from detention officers. They can do fingerprints. They wanted to do it. We've trained them, so they're already trained to do it, and they've gone out and done some prints. So we can we don't have to create a new classification. We can just allow sure. them to do the duty and hire two more of those. And when they go out, can they do, quote, unquote, the entire report uh, in terms of just the paperwork part of it, or does the officer have to do? The reason I'm asking is because uh, I know that there's always situations where sometimes residents would like to be able to to get a report done sooner or later, but of course those officers are tied up in other places. So I'm just wondering, is that going to be able to alleviate some of that, or can they just do fingerprints? I was curious. Yes, sir. Currently, what what, what the plan is? Currently, they can only go. Uh, an officer takes a report, and they go take the prints. So the officer can go. We're, we're, we're looking at our practice and policies of how we can structure it to where they can just go out and take that report on their own. Because right now, if you walk into the police station uh, right, right next door, uh, there's likely one of those detention officers, PSP, sitting at the front desk, and they take reports all the time in front of the glass. The, the, what we're having to measure and manage is the risk to the employee, even though they'd be going on what we would call delayed calls. The crime's already occurred. People are gone. Uh, maybe the citizen gets upset for some reason, or maybe the perpetrator comes back if it's a residential burglary or a business burglary, and we don't want them out there exposed to risk. They won't have weapons. Uh, they only each have handcuffs and, and pepper spray. That's, that was their uh, training in the jail, so they're used to using that. So we do long-term uh, want to identify calls that they will go out and just handle completely on their own. But right now, you're correct. The officer will take the report, and they'll come behind them and take the fingerprints. And assessing the safety long term is the goal before we can do those other. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank one, you so we'll much. ensure the employee safety at all costs. All right. The police digital case filing program, this was not in the five year plan, uh, but this is something that's come up as a need for us. Uh, basically, what this will do is enhance our ability uh, to comply with state law. There's a Brady rule and there's a Michael Morton Act, which requires us to release all evidence, uh, uh, even exculpatory evidence, to the prosecution team and to the defense team as soon as possible. There's their state mandated deadlines. Right now, the DA puts on us a five day deadline for filing misdemeanor cases and a, and a 10 day deadline for most felonies. With homicides, we get up to 90 days. But uh, with the inclusion of our body cameras, our dash cameras, any interviews in the interview room that we record, gathering, so gathering that digital evidence, collecting it, uh, uh, storing it, uh, retrieving it, redacting it, and releasing it is a significant amount of work. And it's, uh, so we already have two people doing this job and they're constantly up against a deadline and I'm concerned that we're, we're not going to meet our deadline and get in trouble. So. That's why I want to ask for this uh, extra person in the computer workstation for them to be able, because the DA has set up an electronic case filing system, so as we store all this data, it has to be imported to the DA system electronically. And uh, it's, it's just very tedious, time-consuming work. They do a tremendous job, and I just, I just think that they're being overwhelmed right now. And so that's what this is about. Okay. Our capital replacements, we're looking at 12 vehicles. Currently, we're looking at six Explorers and uh, Ford Explorers and six Chargers. You may have seen the news in Austin PD. It was a big news story in some of the other agencies about the Explorers having carbon monoxide issues. We've had uh, three reports of the carbon monoxide detectors going off in these vehicles. There's no recall from Ford. There's no safety bulletins on it. It's just the, the, the carbon monoxide detectors are there. We believe that the vehicles are safe for operation. Uh, and, and so right now we already have two in service, 
and officers do like them. Uh, they provide more room. Uh, since we all come in different shapes and sizes and rather portly people like myself, uh, the Charger's a, a tight place to squeeze into. Uh, uh, I'm trying to keep it real, sir. So uh, the, um, the uh, Explorer gives them a little more room. And the Tahoe is, is a V8 engine. This is a turbocharged V6, so we still get good performance, good acceleration, it, and the, the fuel cost is, is less, and the officers, the officers do like them. Uh, we, we have our fleet manager, uh, Sergeant, is uh, Sergeant Alexander. He's looking at it. He's done research. He thinks they're fine. He drives one regularly. Uh, and, but if we are monitoring that, if it becomes an issue, the police association president's right here. Uh, we talk regularly. He has my cell number. I have his. And if it becomes an issue, we'll address it. We're not going to buy 12 at one time, so we're going we're to space them out as we replace the, as they hit the mileage limits. We, we buy them. So if it becomes an issue, we can switch back. Uh, the, the Ford Explorer is also about $4,000 cheaper, $4,500 cheaper than the, than the Tahoe, so it saves on capital costs as well. But we will not sacrifice safety of officers for savings of money, uh, not in any way. We don't believe that officers' lives are at risk in this vehicle. Uh, so if there's an alert, we can, we can do something about it. But it's important to point that out. Okay, going forward with the... Uh, Five-year personnel plan for next budget year. Those two officers we deferred for this year. We hope working with HR, we can fill the other vacancies and we'll be able to fill these next four. Uh, as for the two that were proposed for 18, 19, and the additional ones, uh, in, in year uh, four of the plan, we want to get a computer uh, lab technician. Currently, we have two detectives who work in there, and if we can either, if the work capacity is such, we want to free up on those detectives to go do other duties and have a civilian do that job, download cell phone. There was a time when I started in 1988, everybody kept little ledgers and stuff, no more. Everybody uses these things, iPads, tablets, uh, laptops. So anytime we do a search warrant or we work a, cr a crime investigation, the cell phones and electronic devices are critical uh, to gather evidence in, of, of, the, of the crime on. And so we have to have people who can do that job. The last one is a civilian planning and research specialist, and that's in year five. For the technology, uh, for this year, we want to start a citywide monitoring system, phase one. That will be getting some camera arrays to spread around the city. Uh, concentrated here in the, in the retail district in the first part because we have a lot of uh, crime in that area. We believe if we get um, cameras in, in some of those areas like Restaurant Row, uh, in and around the mall, working with them also, that we can, we can do that. This uh, retail district, the LPR, the license plate reader, same thing, uh, getting the license plate data. Uh, would be very important. Major egress monitoring system, so identifying major thoroughfares in the city, uh, in and out of the city that we can put uh, license plate readers on or cameras to gather data coming in and out. So this $600,000 proposal, right now that's scheduled to come uh, out of seizure money. Uh, but we're, we're monitoring that because we have spent significant amount of seizure money. We can scale this up or down. We can, we can slow it down or we can pick it up depending on, on uh, what the financial or the fiscal situation is at the time. Here's some of the things I talked about. If you look at the upper left there, that's a, one of the monitoring stations uh, uh, that we'll be looking at, uh, somebody who's monitoring cameras. The bottom, or we'll just go uh, clockwise. The middle top there is uh, we hope to tie into existing infrastructure network when we put these cameras. That's where we can put a, a, hopefully a camera, a police camera on top of a, a signal, a traffic signal. So we can tie into the, to the, like I said, the infrastructure. We don't have to rebuild everything. The uh, top right there is, a, is the uh, city, citywide uh, surveillance system. That box will be a big white box. We'll put a badge clearly identifying it as a Mesquite Police Department camera, and everybody will know it. The bottom right is the covert LPR, a license plate reader. It looks like a speed wagon because it'll put out, it'll note people's speed as they drive by, but it will also take a digital image of their license plate and we can enter that for intelligence gathering purposes later on. We can deploy that then in neighborhoods that either have speeding complaints or high incidences of property crime, uh, especially several of our neighborhoods have, you know, one major point in and one major point out. If we capture data going in and people coming out, it'll help us uh, backtrack and solve crimes. That's the plan. The fixed license plate readers, again, use it on existing infrastructure and in, in, uh, locations throughout the city, tying into the, to the traffic, uh, using the traffic infrastructure. And the last one is an overt um, surveillance trailer. That's the camera trailer I talked to you about. It has an array of cameras that you can uh, deploy anywhere, put it into a um, 
plug it into a power source and you can gather. So we can use this at uh, in, uh, summer sizzle, Christmas in the park, things like that. We can do video surveillance of, of the uh, big major events that we have. Okay, so the technology plan for 1819 is just to keep growing and the really all the way rest through 2021 for the next five years is to keep growing and building out that, that, uh, that major egress uh, monitoring system and the license plate reader system. So we can scale that. We can go as, as much or as little as we need to, like I said, depending on the, on the finances at the time. So the personnel requests were all being made to make the most efficient use of staffing, provide the highest level of public safety to the community and to increase use of technology and reducing crime. Those were our two, two city council goals we're trying to accomplish with that five-year plan. So again, uh, this is the structure of the department org chart. We're going to go into the quarterly report a little bit here. Um, it's myself, two assistant chiefs, and four captains. The four captains each over, oversee a bureau. Our authorized personnel, just last Monday, uh, you, you, you adopted the ordinance to increase our strength by three to backfill the one SRO that we sent extra and the two canine officers. So now we're at 234 authorized sworn. We're currently down 12 positions. We started an academy class last week with seven in the academy and two, two laterals. Talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, our, our civilian staffing is at, is at 88 right now. And so I think we're right now we're four down in the jail. But those four result of promotions for people from detention officers to PSPs. And we're currently... Uh, we're screening candidates for that job now uh, for the detention officer position. And I think we're only one person in dispatch down. I interviewed a, a candidate last week, Friday, and approved her. So she should be in the process. We should be full in dispatch when she comes on board. Uh, with the staffing, one thing I didn't mention earlier I, I, about uh, the struggles of recruiting and things is this. I, I look at this organization it's kind of like a church like it's a ministry okay we serve people and it's a lot of people are under the misconception that it's the it's the pastor's job to fill up the church and it's not it's the people who are members there they're supposed to tell people i got a great pastor delivered a powerful message you need to come so i don't want to abdicate anyway our responsibility as members of the mesquite police department both sworn and non-sworn that we need to recruit good people we can't sit back and complain and point the finger at you and say please solve our recruiting problem or HR and say please solve our recruiting problem each one of us needs to be an ambassador for this organization to talk about the great things we have going on here and the tremendous opportunities and and uh, look for like-minded folks to come join us it's everyone's responsibility to recruit um, so I do fully support uh, Rick's uh, civil service recruiting specialist fully support that that's an advocating our role we're gonna send officers with with that specialist to career fairs to, to tell the story of the Mesquite Police Department. But um, it, it's important for me to not leave you with the thought that we're just asking everybody else to solve our problems for us. We, we have a stake in this, and we all need to be active participants in it. This is our staffing um, of the, of the uh, this is 224, but since this slide was presented, we got two retirement letters. One guy got the job at North Mesquite High School. Uh, so they're still on the books right now, but I know they're going to be leaving. Uh, one got the job at North Mesquite High School teaching criminal justice. He's been a police officer 28 years. He's he's just ready to retire. He's what, in that group that was that bubble I talked about. And another one, he's retiring. Uh, his his wife they have a family business and they're doing very very well. And he needs to he's going to retire and go work with his wife in their in their family business. So it's a uh, there's no you know recruiting incentive. There's there's no pay. There's nothing that's going to change their minds. Uh, there's just time. For both of those guys so that's why I said we have 12 vacancies even though on paper right now we just have 10 so make sure that you know that. So dispatchers there's one vacancy like I said I interviewed her uh, candidate and approved her for hire she passes the next two steps she'll be hired and detention officer that shows five again I've hired one since then approved one for hire since then he's already been approved waiting to get his start date the budget as I said mentioned the 22 17 18 proposed it's 33,615, some change there. Here's how it breaks down. Almost half of our budget, over 49%, goes to operations. Operations is patrol and traffic, the uniform function of the department. When somebody calls 911 or they're involved in an accident or whatever, these are the people that are going to show up. So that's our largest bureau. Most of our personnel are dedicated there. Technical services runs our jail, our dispatch, and our property room. Um, 
Investigations, of course, is self-explanatory. They do everything from property crimes investigations to robbery, homicide, to computer crimes investigations, forgery, financial crimes. Staff support. Now, staff support, actually, the SRO and LETS program is part of staff support, but we have to we show them different and line items on the budget because uh, SRO and LETS are reimbursed to us, as I mentioned earlier, 50% by MISD, so it's easier to bill them if they have their own org number. So we have, they have their own org number, so when we do the reimbursement and bill them, it's easier to track. But uh, SRO and LETS is part of staff support. They have the SRO LETS program, they have our hiring function, our crime prevention function, and our training function are all part of uh, staff support. And just kudos to staff support. We just w went through the re-recognition process. Those of you who have been on council know that we, we, we were recognized in 2013 as a recognized agency by the Texas Police Chiefs Association. We just received word we re-recognized re and uh, we passed the inspection. Captain Bill Ortizzi and his staff uh, led the effort to get us re-recognized. They did a lot of work to get, make that happen. There will be something coming forward again at City Council. Uh, we'll be talking to the City Manager about that. And then, of course, administration. Our budget, this is what I really want to show, personnel services, 90, over 92% of our budget covers salaries and benefits. Gives us less than 8% with any flexibility whatsoever, and 6% of that 8, almost 6.5% is in contractual obligations. That's paying our maintenance and licensing fees for the technology we use. Um, and so we, we don't have much wiggle room in the budget. When you talk about budget, you're talking about people in, in the police department. We're very uh, people-centric in our budget. Workload indicators, uh, you look at, we use the population that's adopted by the council, which is 142,000 and some change there. Uh, there's different you know, population estimates out there from 144 to 145, 100, 144,000, we use the one that the council adopts. So you see our population at the top, our cost for service at the bottom. The cost for service had been trending down even though the population was increasing, <clears throat> and we had a slight increase in 2016 over 2015 of about a couple hundred, it's like a couple hundred calls there. Our communication center, the men and women of our dispatch center work very, very diligently. They handle a tremendous amount of calls, 95,000, just over 95,000 calls as you saw before. That, that's calls that result in police or fire being dispatched, calls for police service. The number one, uh, um, count here is traffic stops. Traffic stops are something that are self-initiated. There's no call sheet for that, but they log it in and they record that. So we had over 22,000 traffic stops last year. When you add that to the 95,000 calls we responded to, we had over 117,000 contacts between those two. That doesn't count pedestrian stops or just stopping to talk to people or community events. We have, so we easily have over 125, 130,000 contacts with people every year. And overwhelmingly those contacts are positive. We have had a few disciplinary incidents, but in the grand scheme is very, very small. One of the things I want to point out here is about the fourth item down, the residential business alarm. Uh, we, we answered 9,300 uh, alarm calls last year. 99.01 uh, is, is 0.93 percent were actually good alarms. 87 resulted in actual reports being generated. Overwhelmingly, the report, the alarms we respond to are, are false. Uh, we do work with businesses, uh, particularly one like the, I'm not throwing them under the bus, but Tractor Supply, uh, they have an inordinate amount of alarms, but they work very closely with us. Uh, they have a situation at the back where they have motion sensors because they have material they don't want to get stolen, but they also have feed back there, and the critters will come from the creek bed back there, and they'll set off that motion sensor, and we, we respond a lot. They've, they've done a lot over the last year to, to help alleviate that problem. but but. Um, People pay for those alarm systems, and they expect us to show up when they go off, so we do. Again, our communication center, I want to highlight some of the things that they do. Just in 2016, uh, they handled 142,000 emergency calls. That's police and fire. You can see overwhelmingly uh, wireless calls, uh, landline. You, you look at the comparison between the landline calls. Our 911 system was developed for landlines back in the day when it was developed and overwhelmingly we get wireless calls so the t keeping up with that technology is going to be important going forward. We do have text to 911 capability now. It's handled like a, the TDD uh, for the deaf person when they, when they type a call in. It's handled like that but it still gets in there. Uh, we also had over 270 non-emergency calls, last, 270,000 non-emergency calls. So last year our dispatch center handled uh, uh, with their with their Inbound and outbound calls too handle over 400,000 calls to the center. Uh, there's 30, 
when I saw the number, there's, there's 39 folks, 38 uh, people, because they, they hadn't been full the whole time, and they, they had a tremendous volume of calls coming in out of there. And they assist officers in the field uh, every day as well. So, total arrests, our, our crime uh, rate has been dropping, as we, we'll see in a bit. So our arrest rate has been dropping correspondingly uh, to that. The uh, adult arrests are in the red line at the top, the juvenile arrests are at the bottom. There was a big drop in juvenile arrests from uh, 15 to 16. Overwhelmingly, juveniles are arrested for, for theft, for property crimes, and for possession of, uh, of drugs, marijuana and stuff at, at, at school. Those are the two largest categories for them, for juveniles being arrested. When you look at the part one offenses, the UCR report, robbery, uh, murder, robbery, aggravated assault, sexual assault, um, let's see, uh, burglary, theft, the number of adults arrested for Part 1 offenses were 1,124, and 62% of those arrested for Part 1 offenses came from outside the city of Mesquite, of the adults. For juveniles, 167 total arrests, and 60% of those were Mesquite kids. Sorry. Yes, I'm I, sorry. It, I'm, I apologize. It took me a minute. Could you go back to the Mesquite, non-Mesquite? Thank you, sir. So... Does that include uh, domestic violence assault? If it's an aggravated assault. If it's a felony assault, yes, a strangulation, impaired breathing, that's a felony assault, that would count an aggravated assault. And I'm sorry, I'm, the, the little mouse is on the wheel for me right now. I'm just okay. trying to. So 38% mesquite, and I know you're not going to know, no, no, right off the top of your head, but I mean, a significant portion, or at least a, a good portion of the 38%, are going to be domestic violence, whereas the non-mesquite are probably unlikely to be domestic violence arrests. Is that fair or not? Well, no, sir. For aggravated assault, there may be a good portion that are that, but robberies, homicides, sexual assaults, they're not necessarily going to be family violence. And In fact, fam family violence, husband and wife or intimate partner, is a very small percentage of our sexual assaults. Right, right, right. Okay. No, I, I, what I'm trying to figure out is, is this 6238 spread even more significant if you remove domestic, and, and I'm not meaning to remove domestic violence for any importance level, okay. but if you remove domestic violence, which we can assume arguendo is going to be mesquite-based because one or both are going to live here, if you remove domestic violence, aggravated assault, strangulation, you know, weapon, uh, significant injury, doesn't that increase even more non-mesquite versus mesquite for the origin of the perpetrator? Well, I, well, I guess yes. Sir. If you just took the mesquite, the, the mesquite people. I mean, if you took the domestic violence, I, it, 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 I think it would be more dramatic or. I don't know. I don't know how more dramatic it would change the numbers definitely. I yes, mean, you see, you see what I'm thinking with, with with that then, because then it, it increases the amount of non mesquite perpetrator percentage for the uh, 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 those other type one crimes as a point of origin for the perpetrator. I think that's fair. Yes. Okay, that's it. Just trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> this is just part one, sir. It's not. It's not the rest of it. So. <laughs> yes, sir. And then the juvenile crime. There we go. Traffic citations. <clears throat> Traffic citations took a nosedive after 2013. Especially from 2014, what happened in early in, in the year, the spring of 2014, the, the the state had a budget. State of Texas had a budget crunch, and they cut statewide the STEP grant, which is the traffic enforcement grant, selected so traffic enforcement program. 30% across the board. So that impacted 2014. In February 2015, they raised the speed limit on 635 from 65 to 70, which gave more of a cushion, and so that was there. In 2016, uh, we saw an uptick, uh, pretty significant, 2,500 more citations issued. Starting last year, we started making emphasis on traffic, just like you see in our, our communications program, working with Wayne and his staff, Drive Like Your Family Lives Here. Last year, we had 15 people killed in motor vehicle accidents. We had several people injured, seriously injured. So in Mesquite last year, you'd have been more likely to be seriously injured or killed in a motor vehicle accident than you would be in a, uh, uh, from a violent crime. 
So overwhelmingly, so we, we focus our energies there in English and in Spanish. That you see the signage up, you see the program up, and we're taking that message to every, everywhere we, we go. So you'll see increase there. One of the ways to impact, there's, there's three ways to impact traffic safety that's been proven. Research-based, uh, evidence-based proof is that you increase traffic, uh, 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 seatbelt enforcement, to make people wear their seatbelts. People don't wear their seatbelts are more likely to die in a crash. Speed enforcement and DWI enforcement, impaired driving enforcement. Those three things impact traffic safety, and that's, that's what we started doing right there. Open records request. This is a. This is going to be. I'm sorry. And, and I'll, I'll, I can't see your your hand. No, 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 no. That's and 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 again, for me, I'm like Homer Simpson. It takes me a minute. Things sink in, and then I go, oh. Um, so for traffic stops, for what originates as a Class C, running red light, speeding, seatbelt violations. If you know, how many of those turn into? A more significant issue, for example, drug arrests or warrant for felony warrant or things of that nature. How many of those initial contacts for a Class C fine only turn into a more significant uh, item, if you know? I, I could get that number, sir. I, it would just be anecdotal at this point. I, I don't know the number. Uh, but I know, I know that some do. I just, I just don't know the number. Well, and the reason I'm asking that is that there, there, there is a certain dialogue in the community that traffic enforcement is purely for revenue generation. Um, and, and But, you know, you, you went through, and I appreciate that, the, the human toll on traffic accidents, traffic fatalities, things like that. But I think the other element is, is that uh, if you legitimately stop someone for a traffic violation, um, not all, but a significant portion of those, you're also stopping a bad guy who we just talked about significantly are coming from out of Mesquite, you just stopped a bad guy who may have a pound of marijuana in the front seat or, you know, uh, some other felony warrant situation, and that stopped that person from perpetrating a crime in Mesquite. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yes, there's, yes sir. There's, there's a number of people who do get arrested from a traffic, they initiate from a traffic stop for different things, for, for drugs, for weapons, for warrants, for other things, yes. Very good. That's fair. Thank you. Uh, open records request. This is something I wanted to mention a little bit here. We dipped a little bit last year, but we have a full year of the body cameras now. And again, as I mentioned, this, the collection, storage, retrieval, redaction, and release of that information is going to be um, more cumbersome going forward. And I think it's going to take a lot more staff hours. Uh, we have uh, staff down in the record section that already catalogs all of our uh, reports and everything and releases accident reports, but they're going to spend a lot more time, I believe, here in the future dealing with open records requests, dealing with video, uh, video records request. Crime stats. I know um, folks don't like to believe this unless, uh, uh, unless it's high, but, uh, but here it is. <laughs> uh, we finished last year, the FBI still hasn't released their final numbers, 42.15 crimes per thousand. And so that's our lowest in 30 years. And, of course, if you're the one murder victim or the, well, one of the murder victims or the family of one of the murder victims, it doesn't matter if we had 100 murders or one, it, it impacted your family. I get that. But um, here we are, um, and we're going to show a break out of that in a bit. Violent crime, violent crime is trending upward. We went from 3.32 crimes per thousand, violent crimes per thousand, to, to 4, uh, 4.13, I believe it was. I can't see the rest of the number there. Uh, this last year, um, the numbers of the crimes have stayed the same. The FBI uses the U.S. Census data. The reason why I'm saying it hasn't been fully released yet, the raw numbers will not change, but the FBI uh, will use a different uh, divider, uh, population number to divide in than what we do. We, we use the, the city population, the 142,000 that the council adopts, uh, but, but they use a different number. Uh, with that, the two categories of crime that are increasing in violent crime is, is, are robberies and We've had 118 robberies so far this year, and out of those, we separate those into business robberies and individual robberies. In business robberies, we've had 31. 11 of those are what we would call shoplifts gone bad, where somebody's committing a theft, a shoplift, they're confronted by loss prevention or a member of the store management, and they use physical force to try to get away. And when you use physical force in the commission of a theft, by the definition, that's a robbery. Now, there are some cities, one of our neighbors here, he, uh, the chief and I have regular conversations, and 
he likes to joke that that's a theft for somebody got assaulted. And I'm like, no, that's a robbery. And so we report that as a robbery. We carry that on our books as a robbery, even though when for analysis purposes and how we deploy our resources, we separate those out as we can't deploy around a shoplift gone bad, but we can deploy around the other, what we would call traditional robberies of businesses, the other 20. And so we track those. We had 87 individual robberies. Out of those, um, 38 of them were people engaging in criminal activity, ranging from prostitution to drug dealing. And yes, if somebody gets robbed or they, they tell us they're going to buy some drugs and they get robbed and assaulted, we, we don't, you know, they, somebody took their money, took their cell phone, took their property. We record that as a robbery. Uh, we we'll never go anywhere prosecution-wise, but we, we take the robbery. I know a lot of folks have seen some of the things where they, they don't believe our crime stats. We report stuff that I think other agencies wouldn't report. We record it, and we, we take the hit for it. But you can't deploy resources around that kind of robbery. Uh, but it's, it's, it's what the rule says. It's what the UCR rule says, and that's offices known to police, and we record them. We did have 49 of what we would consider traditional robberies, everything from individuals to pizza delivery drivers, uh, carjackings. We had uh, four carjackings, and we had we had 10 robberies that resulted from Internet apps or dating apps. And we even have the safe zone out here where people content to go and meet someone at 2 o'clock in the morning to buy a $200 iPhone and get robbed. I don't know why they do that. It's not very smart, but it's still a robbery. And uh, we've had we've had four that I know of where they go to meet somebody on one of these dating apps at 3 in the morning and they get robbed. Uh, it's, not, it's not a date at 3 in the morning. There's another term for that, which I won't go into right here on the record, but uh, it's uh, that's what happens, and we, we, and we catch the case. We, we eat the offense for it. Property crime. Um, again, it's trending downward. The biggest areas of reduction is, um, is in burglaries right now, residential and business burglaries. What we haven't seen a reduction in at all is burglary of a motor vehicle. 20% uh, of all reported crime in the city of Mesquite is, uh, is a burglary of a motor vehicle, one out of every five. Our analysis has shown us month after month that anywhere from 38 to 40% of those burglary motor vehicles were unlocked vehicles. And so our lock, take, and hide program that we've been pushing out to the, through the Chamber of Commerce, through other means, through our crime watches, we're about to do another, another push on that. Uh, working with the Wayne's group and, and city manager directed us to, to, to do something more, and that's what we're going to do. Um, and so, lock, take, and hide is important. If you can't, you know, if you lock your vehicle, that, that, that reduces your risk of being a, a victim. You, you limit that opportunity to be a victim if you just lock your car or take your valuables with you or hide them if you can't. So, that's the big thing for us here in Mesquite. You can see our UCR crimes January to June. Each of the years, they're trending down slightly. Each one of offense is known to police, and that's including taking all those, you know, hits for, for the, 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 the shaky robberies. Our index crime here, you can see our crime. The dark blue is the property crime, and the, the gray is the violent crime. So overwhelmingly, uh, our reported crime in the city of Mesquite is and always has been property crime. Um, we, we had... We've had some violent crime. We had the, the double murder in Shands just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we, we've had five murders so far this year, and so we had four last year. So uh, those things do happen. I'm not saying that we're immune to that, but but it's uh, if you do one of if you if you don't if you're not a member if you don't sell drugs or hang out with people who do sell drugs if you don't associate with drug dealers if you're not a gang member you don't associate with people who are gang members. If you don't carry a gun illegally, and if you don't engage in disputes with people who have a worse criminal record than you, your chances of being a homicide victim are very, very low. So, yes, sir. Most of the time when they get into arguments, don't ask, do you have a criminal record, right? No, sir, but I think most of us know. You can look at some, well, I, I agree. You can look at people and know. <laughs> I agree. You know the street cred anyway. <laughs> Here's the murders for the last few years. We were down from 15 to 16, but we're already above the 16 number at five, with the double at Shands. Sexual assault, this is another one. 2013, they changed the definition of sexual assault, 2014 rather, and uh, you see the big uptick there. Of those 66 offenses that we had reported in 2016, three were stranger on stranger crimes. 63 knew their attacker, which is higher than the, the national average is, is that um, two-thirds 
of the, of the women who are assaulted will know who their attacker is and, and some some acquaintance or somebody that they know. Um, and then uh, we're above that at 63 out of out of 66, and uh, 40 of those were were some adult caregiver of a child, uh, somebody who's responsible for a child, and and a child is from 16 and below. We're not talking about just babies, but teenagers and inappropriate relationships that resulted in in, in cases that come out of that. So robbery, we talked about robbery already. Um, we have 118 now at this point in the year. Last year we had 250 by the end of the year. Aggravated assault, this was mentioned a while ago, aggravated assault is, um, is, is one of the areas we had an increase in. Last year, road rage was a big deal. We had 10 offenses of road rage last year that we recorded that had at least three or more victims in each of those vehicles. If somebody shoots at a vehicle or points a gun at a vehicle, every occupant in that vehicle is a victim. And so we take those. So we had 10 offenses that resulted in 33 victims uh, last year. And we had the high publicized the road rage on I-30 uh, about three weeks ago. And then we had the one in Arlington and, and where there was somebody murdered. And Richardson had one where there was someone murdered. So road rage is, is the thing now. Uh, people don't they get upset and they settle their disputes or their, take out their frustrations with a, with a handgun or with a firearm. And it's uh, with deadly results oftentimes. This does not separate the family violence. This is where the, the family violence and the non-family violence would be more marked right here in, in, in aggravated assaults. It's to your point, uh, Mr. Miklos. Burglary. Again, I've mentioned burglary was trending downward. You can see a significant drop from 2011 uh, down to 2016. Uh, you know, a huge drop in offenses there, uh, 800 reported offenses. And then thefts. Thefts covers everything. From burglary of a motor vehicle, breaking into a car, or taking something out of a car, uh, tailgate thefts, thefts from motor vehicle accessories, stealing a potted plant off the front porch, stealing the barbecue grill with the weed eater left out in the front yard where you went to get something to drink, or whatever the case may be. Uh, theft encompasses all of those offenses, and you can see the, the trends for the last 11 years. Motor vehicle theft, again, uh, trended down last year, and so far we're holding about that same pace this year. And so, um, juvenile arrest, um, this, a while ago, the first slide when we talked about the 167 arrests for juveniles, that was just for uh, part one crimes. This counts part one and part two. So simple assault, possession of marijuana, the arrests are all counted here. So 499 last year. Traffic fatality and accidents, as I mentioned, 15. So for two years in a row, we had a significant number of motor vehicle fatalities. That's why the emphasis on driving like your family lives here, English and Spanish messaging, really reaching out to the community and uh, trying to drive that point home. Injury accidents, again, uh, we had 779 accidents for somebody reported to be injured, some of those very seriously injured. And I'll field any questions at this time. Yes, you know, sir, Mr. Mayor. Chief, Chief, before we get around to the questions, you now you, you made a comment, and, and I appreciate it, about the overall crime index. And you came and presented to us a few months ago, and we talked about the trend is per capita and it's per thousands. Yes, sir. But, but I believe, and as you've shown us today, you've never once said that all of our crime in Mesquite is down. I'm looking at violent crimes being up. I'm looking at uh, sexual assaults being up. Robert, there are categories of crimes that we are that are increasing Mesquite, and we recognize that. Yes, and our police department recognizes Absolutely. that. So I, I'm just kind of wanting to make sure that our that people look look at this later and all understand. Overall, our crime index of crime per thousand incidents has trended downward, but that doesn't mean we don't have some categories that are up that we we are continuing to work very hard and we recognize and realize that. Uh, I just think there's some time of misperception that people have a mistrust and say these numbers and facts are not are incorrect and I think that we pres I just want to say thank you for presenting the correct facts because I agree with what you've given us that the overall rate is maybe trending downward but we have a lot of areas that we're working on so I just I, you know I think it's worthy when we're all together and have the opportunity to um, visit there so yes but thank you Mayor. The, the men and women of this police department both sworn and non-sworn all work very very hard each and every day to make our city a great place to live work and play there's no doubt in my mind. I've ridden out with them. I've been out there with them. 
I've seen him at work. I've sat in the dispatch center. I've gone to the records unit. I've seen everybody. Uh, everybody's pulling on the rope, as they say, and rolling the boat in the same direction. So we're, we're all working together, and I want to make sure that that doesn't get lost in, in the conversation, that the men and women drive this train. I'm just here to be the captain to point in the right direction. Well, I think that sometimes the, there's a misnomer that people think we don't have crab and mesquite. We have crab and mesquite, and we're continuing to work at that. We know recently we've seen several incidents of crime and mesquite that we're trying to, to combat, and, and I just uh, appreciate you, and I appreciate you bringing this forward. Robert, you had something? Um, on the vi Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on the violent crime element, just statistically, um, as that is increasing, statistically, what do you see as uh, being the energy that's driving that increase? Is it juvenile perpetrators that are driving that increase? Um, is it theft that turns into violence? What statistically is driving the increase in violent crime, statistically? In my opinion, sir, and I want to yes, preface sir. it with that, there's two things that drive the crime rate in, in the state of Texas, the city of Mesquite, and in the nation. Uh, one is drugs. Uh, the pursuit of narcotics, uh, the money that's associated with it will cause uh, people to do bad things. If you do an analysis for homicides in any city, across America, about 80 to 85 percent of all homicides will involve, in some aspects, guns, uh, some organized criminal element, whether it's a cartel or a gang or whatever, and, and it'll involve drugs. Uh, that's, that, it's, it's competing for territory, you're trying to rob one another, whatever the case may be. So the drug trade fuels, right. fuels that. That's number one. The other thing, one of the reasons I mentioned before in our quarterly report about the NIBIN system is in in the justice system, there's a narrative right now that the mass incarceration movement of the 80s and 90s was a failure, okay? And, and I understand that. Uh, people, there are people who need a second chance, who need to be rehabilitated. There, there, there are people redeeming qualities who made a mistake. I get that. In fact, we participate in the first offender program with juveniles. If they get an arrest, it's not a, where a person's not the victim of the crime, the theft or possession of marijuana or something, they have a chance to go to this first offender program, complete it, get it off their record, and never have to deal with it again. But uh, people who use guns, who use weapons, are going to hurt somebody the longer they're out there. And I believe that uh, I want to get this NIBIN system because it's a cooperative effort with the ATF, I'll call it the Back on Farms Group, uh, uh, and, and we're going to try to get as many people who use guns in the commission of violent crime prosecuted in federal court. That's my, that's my end game. We start with this because in federal court there's minimum sentencing guidelines. If you have a pistol and a commission violence, it's five years, no questions. If you discharge it, that's five more years. If you injure somebody when you discharge it, you shoot someone, that's five more. I mean, uh, some people need a second chance, but when you harm another human being with a firearm in the Commission of Violent Act, uh, I, I think you, you need to be locked up because you're going to hurt somebody. Yeah, we shouldn't wait till they, till they murder someone. That's just my opinion. So let me un understand. Let me spit this back and see if I've got this right. So number one driver of the increase in violent crime, you believe, are drug and drug-related incidents of crime. Yes, sir. And second are... Um, people with previous significant criminal records who have been discharged. They may be on paper, but they're discharged in, in our community. They are armed, and they are committing violent acts with firearms. Well, not just this community. The community is all, all around the region, yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. So, and you're looking towards when a, a violent act is committed, by someone on paper, someone with a previous record, and they have a firearm and they discharge, you're, what you're saying is, let's get them out for good by prosecuting through, through the federal system. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. A question on our K-9 units. I know they've only been out a small amount of time. Since they have gone in service, what kind of call volume? I mean, are they on a base by base, or are they... Patrols, I mean, how are they? How are they sent to calls, and what kind of how, how many calls since we put them in have they actually been used? I, I know that. Uh, well, first of all, they're in the call answering pool. They're out there working a regular shift like everybody else. They respond to calls where they think they can be of assistance, searching a building, uh, 
where somebody bails out of a vehicle or runs from a scene, rob, they try to get a track going. I know they've been involved in several. I can't tell you the exact number of tracks because I get, I get a, a, an email when they use them on a dog track, and I know that they've caught at least three people tracking folks down that had eluded officers, uh, where they just, just uh, you know, following them to where they were hiding. Uh, and then one actually gave, when he heard the dog barking, they said, a police dog, he started barking. He's like, give up, don't turn the dog loose, I'm coming out. So <laughs> he had, the dogs definitely had an impact. Uh, so they're out there during the, the, right now they're working the nighttime shift. And so they're, we, um, they're on a 10 hour day. So they spend, we give them an hour of their shift, 30 minutes on each side to prepare the dog, feed, groom, and then to take care of the dog at the end of the shift. And there is some training time. Since they're still new, there's significant training time that they have to do. So they're on duty, and they're working with the Garland, Grand Prairie, and, and Allen in a training group uh, to make sure they get certified. For when we get our first, uh, uh, for example, a canine search of a car where they get a hit and we get a search warrant, you have to document all the training that they've had. Uh, we actually have uh, narcotics that are checked out that we can, for their training, we can secrete in places and they have to go find them and to document that they found them hex number of times and all that. You have to build a resume, if you will, so they can do that. So there's a significant amount of training right now they're still going through to get that resume built up. And, and uh, we, are, we have done some drug searches with them and things like that. So they're, they're working. Great. Yes, sir. Great. I, I think it was a good, a good thing that we got them, and uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Casper. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chief, thank you. Thank you to Mesquite Police Department for uh, incredible work and being in harm's way. Um, and I, I hope our communications department heard that 30-year uh, low number and we start yelling that from the mountaintop, especially as we go into the development community. I think that needs to be spread far and wide. And I think to the mayor's point, um, we, we know the work's not done and we're going to work hard to get those 12 uh, patrol positions filled as quickly as possible to reverse the uh, violent crime index number that we see increasing because that is concerning. Mm -hmm. um, but I was curious if you could touch on the presence uh, and you know the extent to which organized crime is present in Mesquite and uh, you know if we have a gang unit, I've been asked that several times, if that has any utility, uh, just organized crime in Mesquite. Well, yes, sir. Well, good question, because uh, there's a misconception about gangs. Uh, people see a group of young guys out together, particularly, unfortunately, you see, you see a group of young minority males, uh, African-American or Hispanic, and you just assume they're wearing red or blue, that they're in a the gang, or they're wearing the same color T-shirt, they're in a the gang, and that's not true. By and large, gang membership are adults, 17 and older. It's not juveniles. In fact, of the 141 documented gang members, and what I mean by documented gang members, in our database, uh, to, to be entered as a gang member, you have to have a self-admission. You have to be part of a group of three or more people. You have to engage in criminal act activity for the furtherance of the group. There's certain legal requirements by the Code of Criminal Procedure that spells out. We just can't say, hey, you look like a gang member and put your name in there. So we have to build this case on. We have 141 of those, and only 11 of those are in school here in Mesquite. Uh, the vast majority, 130, are adults. They're not in school or or in school in Dallas or, or Garland or surrounding school districts. So, but most of them are, are adults. Uh, we do have some, uh, some gangs. We have, you know, they're not necessarily here just in Mesquite, but we're, we're a transportation hub. We're a pass-through point. I mean, it, it's, we have 30, 20, uh, we have uh, 635 and Highway 80. So people pass through. It would be naive to think that we don't have significant amounts of narcotics traveling through our city at any given point because it's just we're on a major thoroughfare, east-west thoroughfare from I-20 and, uh, and I-30 all the way to, to Little Rock. And so it's, um, you know, so we work as part of a federal task force. We have a detective on the federal DA task force who gives us updated briefings. Most of the people don't operate the, that way here in Mesquite. They do pass through. They do, they do some work in this area, but they're not, they're not headquartered here by any means. Uh, we're, we're not a place. Uh, Mesquite's still um, kind of a... a small town feel so people know each other and people still talk whether it's to us to each other or on facebook or some method they'll, they'll tell so there's a, a lot of the miss kravitz uh, neighbors you know or maybe uh, uh anybody who remembers miss kravitz like that and those are neighbors who tell about things but um uh there are other places that are more well suited for that so we do have you know we, we have prison gangs we have cartels i mean that's just every city does i'm not saying that they're headquartered here but yes they, they do right. business they pass through here 
So, But you mean to say if there are four Latino or African-American kids playing basketball and wearing red, that's not a gang? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're Just because they look like me and wearing the same color doesn't yeah. mean that they're... they're well, and yeah, I'll remind some of our citizens, uh, as, a, as a teacher of you know, uh, teenagers, uh, they do spend times outdoors and they congregate together, and that's a good thing. Uh, they could be doing a lot worse, and some of our high school colors are blue and red. So, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. There's other part of it now about the gang unit. Do we still have an organized gang? We have two. We have we have a two-person gang unit. Uh, they and here here's the rub for a lot of people. They want people just to work gangs. We don't have the capacity of, of we don't have a gang issue enough to work just a full-time gang unit. We our guy gang guys go out once a month with the juvenile probation department. They do probation checks on these kids uh, who are on paper with the Dallas County Juvenile System. They, they meet them, they know them, they work with the SROs at school to identify them and track them and then know, know where they're at, what, what they're doing and if they're messing up, if they're behaving well in school. Uh, we accompany the juvenile probation office. That program's been going on for about 10 or 12 years. Uh, we used to call it Operation Spotlight. It has a different name now where they would go out and just try to keep the kids on the, on the straight and narrow. It doesn't always work. Well, one of the kids that we, we dealt with, he's, got, he's been arrested 20 times for burglary of a habitation, 20 times. So we, we've arrested him 20 times. He had an ankle monitor. He cut it off, and he was running away and doing all kinds of stuff. So yeah, there are some kids that are just, you know, they're, they're hard-head kids, and, and they can't just be running amok in the neighborhood. If they do, they're impacting people's lives. And so we, we need to have those kids, you know, uh, incarcerated somewhere. That's just the way it is. And until they learn to follow the society's rules and and conform to some, you know, societal behavior norms, uh, they're going to be hurting people wherever they go. And Do so, you still have the um, the pop unit, the problem oriented policing, or is that transitioned to a different name? Or? Every, the way we've divided the city, every lieutenant has a quadrant, a geographical area of responsibility, and each of the eleven sergeants. Well, nine of the sergeants. There's nine beats, so each sergeant has a pop beat. And then that sergeant is responsible for tracking those pop police problem oriented policing locations, addresses, and things. With the, with the addition of our new crime analysts, I want to start mapping those and tracking those on a more. Uh, right now, it's just been kind of haphazard. Is that mm -hmm. ha however organized the sergeant was, how organized his information was, or her information was right now. But with the addition of our crime analysts, I want to track all those things, known gang members where they're residing at, what activities they're involved in. I want to build our intelligence network that we can actually respond. To be an intelligence-led organization, a data-driven organization, we have to have accurate timely intelligence on people, places, and behaviors they're engaging in. We have to deploy rapidly based on that intelligence. So our gang unit will go out, mobilize, and go out at night and do things. Our, our two investigators, uh, they, besides going out with the, with the um, juvenile department, you have to employ effective tactics when you get there. I just got surveillance training. We had 16 officers go through surveillance training in the last two weeks, covert surveillance training, so they could follow people around, learn how to do that. And, and you know, we have to do things differently. We have to do so sure. if it's a street level enforcement, uniform uh, presence, but if it's covert surveillance, we have to be able to do that too. And then we had the, the biggest piece is we have to analyze the results of what we've done, just like the budgeting for outcomes process. That's the most important piece. We have to take a serious look at every expenditure of our resources, of our authority, of our, of, of, of our equipment, and our personnel to see, are we getting the desired bang for the buck here? And if we're not, we need to do something different. Do you ever find any of those pop properties on the T25 program? Is there any time that those are correlated? Yes, sir. There are. Yes, sir. Okay, and, you, and the last question I have, you showed a lot of interesting toys that we're, we're looking at down the road, especially for surveillance, and a lot of them were tied to trailers and kind of mobile. I was just curious, is there any movement in the industry to move towards, like, drone type of surveillance? Those well, just seem to be more mobile. Th th there's all kinds of movement about drones. And drones are the hot thing in law enforcement across the country. I don't see drones as a viable option for us. Maybe on the fire service for some, for some search and rescue, you know, of people or maybe for, for missing person or something. But because we have an airport here so close and FAA regulations, I'd be concerned about the use of drones, uh, uh, in, you know, in this area. I just I just would, uh, and uh, and I don't know that we would get the bang for the buck out of that because mm -hmm. it's still significant expense for having something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Chris, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, lots of good stuff. Um, let me begin by saying 
how pleased I am, I know others are as well, about the real progress that we saw uh, this year with the fireworks and gunshots issues. And, you know, for those who say, oh, it's just fireworks, well, when your house gets burned down or um, people with PS, uh, with post-traumatic disorder and seniors, you know, the stress level that it gives them is, is not a laughing matter. And gunshots, we know, are never good in a populated area. So uh, your guys and uh, the fire guys that worked with them did an outstanding job, which we're very proud of, as well as the number of bad guys that your folks have taken down, including the, uh, the one that was taken down recently after that, those two murders, Shans. So great job. Thank you so much. Um, I know we're working hard to get restaffed up, and I appreciate the efforts to hopefully from this budget we can do more to help with recruiting. Um, I'm going to always uh, go back to, as you spoke eloquently of earlier, to us being more proactive and reactive with community policing. Um, how is the geographic uh, uh, placing that you kind of started putting forward uh, some months back with having, I think, lieutenants uh, over certain areas and whatnot? How's that come along so far? It's come along re really well. The, real, the, the major holdup for that has been is gathering the information, and the lieutenants, they're all watch commanders, a shift commander, and having time to do their regular administrative duties and be out in the field with their troops and to do that research themselves. Again, that's why I think it's going to be invaluable to get our two crime analysts on board and, and get them digging into the data and providing all those, in, those products to the, to the lieutenants. So all they have to do is deploy assets and resources around that they don't have to do the research and right now they're all having to do manual research and and ian purdue is here ian would you stand up please ian has been doing a lot of the research for us on that too he's, he's been doing a lot of the crime analysis work and stuff so far uh but uh, I, I think that's what's going to really get the ball rolling is getting the analysts up and running um and you know while we we never have enough officers to do some of the things we'd like to do and and God willing, if we continue to bring more business and industry here, we can have the resources to hire even more officers to be more proactive. Um, I hope as time goes on and we get a few more officers uh, every few months that we can do a little bit more uh, what I call neighborhood community policing. Uh, for example, we have enough guys and gals on the streets to where um, there's enough that can at least monitor our toughest one to two neighborhoods that we have statistical problems with. So uh, an officer can stop by Mrs. So-and-so's house that oftentimes provides some good intelligence uh, or can stop by that one of many basketball courts in many of our neighborhoods at school campuses or our, park, our parks with a bunch of young men playing who either some might be great kids, maybe some may not be such great kids, and be able to walk on that court and it not be awkward or strange, but that's just Officer So-and-So who always stops and says hi to us. And so I hope that we can continue to, uh, to move towards more of that type of community policing. Yes, sir. And uh, last thing is uh, you mentioned also that we're in a time where many officers uh, or potential officers have to think hard about this career because of the fact that um, even on an officer's best day, one small decision uh, with the best of intentions could cause them to go to jail or, or go through all kinds of misery. And I hope that we're able to continue to, at least in our city, uh, obviously we want to make sure that, you know, if an officer mistreats someone or, or violates their civil rights, obviously we all support addressing that. But at the same time, we can have that happy medium where uh, officers who are out just trying to do the right thing and protect people who may get into a difficult situation that we can support them and they're not looking over their shoulder or being afraid um, which I know every city is dealing with the same thing but I hope we can continue to have that that happy medium but uh, other than that I'm real proud of uh, what you and the department are doing and uh, thank you for keeping us safe yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Allman. Chief I just want to say also I appreciate your work so much and what you're doing and public safety it does it continues to be very high on our list with our priority and so it should be very much so and uh, just wanted to say I, I appreciated your comments a lot earlier about how you're looking for honesty, you're looking for character, you're looking for integrity, and that's the way it should be. We, we've got to keep that there. I want to make sure that 
the officers that we have coming in are the officers that will have that with them as they come in. Uh, my question is along the lines of, I know we're coming off a very difficult year with what happened in Dallas and the officers and around the country and all that, and I know it, the waters were not settled. Do you feel the waters settling somewhat as far as now coming in an upswing for recruitment and the numbers coming up uh, more now for more interest of becoming a police officer and, and that type of thing? Yes, yeah, sir. I, I think I'm seeing people that are still very committed to the profession to want to join the profession. Uh, I've talked to people all the time. Uh, I've been referred by different people. They, they call me or stop me on the street when I'm going to eat. I go to eat lunch here, and, and we talk, and I try to encourage them uh, to come out. Uh, I've been give, given people's names, and they've come and applied. You know, the whole thing is just getting getting the word out there that, um, uh, that, that this is a place where good things are happening. I think that's, that's the most important thing we can do for recruiting. If we have people inside the organization or inside the city walking around kicking rocks and talking about how bad things are who, who wants to who wants to join a place like that that the message and doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be a lie it needs to be the truth we have we have a good thing going here we have great support from our council from our community uh every piece of equipment that we need we have i mean there, there's a lot to go out and tell uh, the story and to recruit people but yes sir, I, I think we're going to see more i was encouraged with this group of seven that we have the, the group that's in the academy now, the senior class, all four are prime military guys. And uh, one of those was the detention officer here who worked here for several years, and now he's, he's in the academy. But this other seven, there were, uh, there were three kids right out of college, one young lady who grew up here, and graduated from Poteet in 2013 and finished her bachelor's degree in three years because she couldn't wait to get here. As soon as she turned uh, of age, she was applying for a job. We got her degree, and she's here. Those are the kind of young folks She's bilingual. She's from here. She cares about the city. She, she's eager to serve here. And there were, there were two other young folks like that right out of college. So we're looking for folks like that, uh, hopefully to spend a, a whole career here. Okay. And, and I'm understanding more in regards to recruitment that, of course, and uh, the proposed budget that we have to help in increasing pay and that type of thing and uh, uh, in the competitive realm that's out there, but that that's a part of it, and then the vetting process and then the exams and all that. If there's a way you could put it on a percentage-wise of how that carries weight, the pay, because I, I want us to be competitive. I want us to be strongly competitive wherever we go, not just in certain places, but the pay, the vetting process, the, um, the exams that are taken, and, and the process of elimination of what's taken place. How would you weigh those things out? Well, I, I think the... Uh the, um, the the pay issue is definitely important. People, when, when all things being equal, uh, and, and I mean, is they're going to have to go through a background check. They're going to have to several 143 cities. Grand Prairie's 143, Garland's 143, Irving's 143. So they have to compete the same, complete the same things in Grand Prairie, Irving, and Garland that they have to do here. You know, so so those things being equal, pay will, pay will matter. So being competitive, I don't think we have to be the very top. Because uh, we we can't compete with Plano, just to be quite honest, we just can't. But we we need to be competitive. And what does competitive mean? I think it's in in the range there. You know, uh, there, there's an average there. Because if I chose to go to work in Dallas in 1988, I chose to go to work there, even though I could have made more, <coughs> excuse me, made more money in a lot of other places. But I grew up there. I was from there. I wanted to serve there. So I think our our real value is recruiting kids who are from here, who have an uh, interest in serving this community because they grew up here. That's where we need to concentrate our efforts going forward. But So pay, pay is important, but getting the folks in our recruiting efforts in the, in the fertile ground that's right here in Mesquite, and then uh, that's almost, if not equal, it's more important than anything else, is picking the right candidates and go to the military, getting people coming right out of the military, <coughs> excuse me, who uh, well, you have a mindset of being at the right place at the right time with the right equipment. You're used to being told what to do, knowing they're not going to be in charge for a while, you know, <laughs> that there's a process before you're going to be in charge of something. You know, getting promoted in the military is like getting promoted here. You have to compete. You have to prepare yourself. You have to have time and grade, all those kind of things. But those are two greatest opportunities going forward. And, um, and another question, but where are we in regards to that program of Unidos that you've talked about and that we could bring into Mesquite and to continue to connect with the Hispanic community here in our city? Well, as you, as you well know, we had our first Crime Watch meeting in Spanish ever uh, at the Iglesia Adventista de Septimo Dia over here on Gross Road. 
and uh, we're going to have a follow-up meeting on August 1st. Uh, Steve Contreras, Officer Contreras is here. Steve, will you stand up a minute? Uh, he went to a regional uh, meeting of the Unidos programs, and he's got some ideas and things. Really, the, the, the issue that's uh, affecting us right now as far as growing the Unidos program is capacity of Spanish-speaking officers. We have 13 uh, Hispanic officers in the entire police department, only seven of which speak Spanish. We have two Anglo officers who speak Spanish, fluent Spanish. And so uh, we're trying to move in a direction where we can sustain whatever programs we start. We started with this church. I'd like to get them going. And then hopefully uh, two of the people in the, in the academy class are bilingual. So as we get each class and get more people integrated into the system who are bilingual, they can assist us in taking that and maybe even working with HR and maybe Eastfield or someplace where we can get some language training. We, as the city manager, Mr. Kahili, mentioned, we've, uh, we've done some Spanish training. Uh, we developed a video to officers watch in their, in their roll call in the squad meetings. But we also have four posters giving Spanish commands because some of the things I saw watching body cam video were they were disturbing, to be quite honest, of how we, we related to people who didn't speak English. And, and being Latino and, and, and being the son uh, of Im a grandson of immigrants, uh, I was... I said, we shouldn't treat people like that. We need to do something about it. And, and we got folks on board, and we, and we did something about it. Steve was part of that. Sergeant Heinz Perry was the leader of that. So we are moving in that direction, making an awareness, even with our canine vehicles. The canine vehicles have a warning in English that says, uh, police dogs, stay back. We put on there, cuidado, canine, caution. Cuidado means ca caution in Spanish. We felt it was important. I felt it was important to put that on the vehicle uh, so that we give them the same protection and dignity that we do anybody else. So we're, um, we're moving that way, sir. It's just the capacity, just getting more Spanish speakers hired. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Chief. Tandy, did you have something else? No. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir.